Well, now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage the Honorable Barbara McQuesten, who is the former Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering and currently the chair of the NATO Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic. Barbara, we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. I see a lot of colleagues that I know and have worked with. And after listening to this morning's conversations, I know that uh, uh, we're doing the important work for the nation that needs to be done. So I'm happy to be here. And uh, also, as we're entering the holiday time, I think we need to look forward to the new year. So I hope all the conversations that we're having today spur a lot of thoughts during uh, uh, during the, the holiday so that we can think about how industry uh, and our position right now can be moved forward. U.S. leadership and in innovation remains strong. Our economic progress, as we heard earlier today and last night, re labor resilience, uh, inflation coming under control, growth, all of these stand out to remain uh, U.S. strengths in the global market. But, but U.S. leadership and in innovation is also an incredible global strength. And thanks to the efforts of many of you in this audience and our entrepreneurial spirit and technology and innovation at the forefront of geostrategic competition. Uh, I really do believe that entrepreneurial spirit that we have in this country is our US superpower in competition. And that's why I always look at innovation programs that have challenges that inspire individuals, our human capital moving forward as being incredible steps to be able to have that leadership within the globe. The Department of Defense, as with government labs and universities, and many of you in this room I'm sure can understand, we are key drivers of innovation with agencies such as DARPA and the DOD investment into manufacturing innovation and workforce development. So the challenge for us all is maintaining the innovation leadership and to set the pace and keep evolving technology trends supporting our global innovation security. So this morning I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Department of Defense and what we're doing to advance US technology leadership for 2024 and beyond. I work directly with Honorable Heidi Hsu, Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. And earlier this year, uh, we released the National Defense Science and Technology Strategy. And I highly recommend that all of you have a chance to be able to uh, refer, refer to this and look at what we're doing, highlighting science and technology priority and goals, investments, and then um, make recommendations on the future for defense research and engineering as a whole. The strategy highlights science and technology priorities, goals, and investments that we are making in the Department of Defense. And this strategy is guided by three critical lines of effort focusing on the joint mission, creating and fielding capabilities and scale, and ensuring the foundation of this country for research and development. As we progress through today's era of competition, it's essential that we invest in critical technology areas to support the joint mission. And the department has identified 14 critical technologies to guide and protect the joint force. By focusing our efforts and investments in these critical technology areas, the department accelerates the transition of key capabilities to the military service and combatant commands. Conflict is not fought by individual services. Rather, defense and security rely on successful coordination among all services in multi-domain operations. And joint experimentation is key to strengthening our support for the joint mission, joint operations, and successful coordination this also extends to operations with our partners and allies. Given the need for coordination, innovation, and interoperability, the department's intent on how we can more rapidly turn technology into capability for our servicemen is paramount. So how do we channel technology into key warfighting functions, such as fires, logistics, command and control, and as Anne was talking about a bit, information advantage, uh, and to act at speeds greater than our adversaries? How do we do this faster than the department has traditionally developed capabilities? One key effort that we have going on in research and engineering to address these challenges is standing up a whole of DOD effort called the Rapid Defense Experimentation Reserve, or RADAR. 
And our goals here are to expand the multi-DOD component experimentation in a structured multi-year campaign of learning, accelerating new capabilities to fill critical joint war fighting gaps. Executed on a recurring annual basis, the program provides resourcing uh, for promising prototypes to execute advanced experimentation evaluation, and if warranted, accelerate transition to the warfighter. To create and field capabilities at scale, the department is implementing programs to bridge the proverbial valley of death to ensure our troops have access to the most cutting edge tools available. Last year, we ended up trailblazing a new program called Accelerate Procurement and Fielding Innovative Technologies, or APFIT, to ex expeditiously transition technologies from development into production. This funding alone is helping to deliver war-winning capabilities one to two years earlier than scheduled while contributing to the health of the U.S. industrial base through investments in small business, non-traditional defense companies, dual-use technologies, and developed capabilities. Last year, 10 small companies received 10 million each to ramp up initial production and accelerate capability delivery to services in two years. This year, we awarded 11 companies 10 to $20 million, each helping the Navy to accelerate the delivery of anti-jam conformal arrays of high data rates for satellite communications, smaller companies to accelerate the delivery of underwater detection sensors for autonomous underwater vehicles. And these are just two examples of the small companies that have benefited from this funding. The department is focused on tech solutions that are posed to deliver leap ahead capabilities to the joint force. We're not interested in engaging in a horse race with our competitors. Rather, we're pursuing transformational technologies that can change the battlefield paradigm. Semiconductors play a pivotal role in this, since they are fundamental to just about every piece of equipment we field, from radar to communications equipment, electronic warfare capabilities, missiles, command and control, vehicle planes, and much more. Almost every funded project for this calendar year relies on advanced semiconductor technology. Satellite communications terminals, integrated air defense cameras, mixed reality pilot training devices, common softwares that air defined air launch munitions role. It's another testament to innovation is the DOD's investment in onshoring domestic microelectronics production. The microelectronics common which is also part of the CHIPS Act funding national network that will create direct pathways to commercialize for US microelectronics researchers and designers. And this is critical, and I'm sure critical for a lot of people here in the room to look at lab to fab and more opportunity to rapidly prototype on, in the IC space. So the microelectronics commons is establishing this national network of regional innovation hubs, which include partners with core fabrication facilities. These hubs are distributed across the US and will reduce barriers to innovation, mature merging tech microelectronics technologies, and enhance existing microelectronics infrastructure and foster a pipeline of domestic talent and innovative ideas. We also have the Small Business Innovation Research Program at the DOD, and we award $2 billion per year in SBIR contracts. To date, the SBIR program alone has played a more pivotal role in creating 70,000 issued patents, supported the development of close to 700 publicly traded companies, and stimulated approximately 41 billion in venture capital investments. And in, 22, in 2022 alone, we had over 6,500 awards. SBIR companies are helping the department in many ways. Methods to accurately measure hypersonics testing, bio-cement to rapidly repair runways, and the development of lightweight, higher resolution night vision goggles for our special forces, and exchanging the range of anti-jam communications. That's just to name a few. We, as we work with our domestic innovation ecosystem, creating and fielding capabilities at scale, it's important that we engage in our partners and allies as well. And then also looking at the role that the SBIR has played and how those companies have started from innovation to technology, we can also acknowledge that it has supported a great deal of dual use technology and commercialization. And NATO has been looking at innovation and I am fortunate enough to chair the NATO Defense Innovation Accelerator for North America or as we call it, Diana. 
and it's uh, supporting the efforts to quickly accelerate the development of game-changing capabilities. And it's interesting because I chair 30, 31 countries, and hopefully soon 32, um, and all of them are participating in this. And this key allied investment, which is over and above, independent of that 2%, uh, they are solely focused on entrepreneurs from the US and across the alliance to look at dual use technology challenges and their applications to security. And a lot of the challenges that we have and we've put out are also to help galvanize and inspire the community. And everyone understands how much innovation often starts with the inventor and the entrepreneur who bring their technology forward. The success is being able to pick up those ideas and support them in the early stages and supporting the startups in their mission, accelerating their time to develop the technology, but also their time to develop the company, to understand their IP strategy, and to help them look at the security base. Because a lot of uh, what I'm finding as I travel as well, uh, especially in, the, in, in today, that we have a lot of entrepreneurs, students, university startups that really want to participate in the challenges that we have today. They actually want to develop science and technology that has the potential for doing things that are very positive in the future. And that includes uh, supporting security challenges. And it's also apparent that the US has the leadership in that. In fact, we should be very much honored that across the NATO countries, the Diana structure is innovation the way the US does innovation. It's competitive at every phase along the way. So even within the uh, first, three, uh, first three challenges that we launched, we were able to receive 1,300 proposals across the alliance, and we've been able to put 44 companies on, on grant this year to get this forward, and that's phase one. And it's really interesting because the program is windows of competitive opportunity across the alliance. But it's also developing a framework, a framework of accelerators and test centers that will be available to the cohorts that come through. So phase one being accelerator or ideation, the ability for the entrepreneur to establish their business and accelerate the process that they need to have, and also to understand how to support them in the defense industry as, as a point of innovation both in meeting and working with traditional companies, but also in being able to understand their market potential and how to secure their IP. Because it's going to be important that as they move forward, they have help as a public-private investment. From the US companies that we have there, we have quite a number of US companies that were in that first cohort. And we also have two key accelerators in the US uh, MIT Mass Challenge and the Pacific Northwest Max, MAC Accelerator Site in Seattle. They are the first accelerators that we're using in this initial phase. Since Diana just started this year, it's what, what we call the initial pilot phase, and we're looking uh, to launch more challenges each year and move, them, move on to cohorts that go through, the, through a number of accelerators and work in phase two, as we do phase one is the ideation, phase two is the ability to uh, then, then select key successful ideas that can be moved into test acceleration and demonstration. So it's not only how to do business, but how to do business with the defense sector and also be able to look across the alliance for interoperability and interchangeability in technology. So for the companies that go forward and also working uh, with NATO at large, we've been able to pull together a strategic analysis for gaps and opportunities and being able to diffuse innovation across NATO so that they can also look at how they do their business practices. As we say, innovation is never about technology, it's about technology, people, and process. And so the ability to be able to have the acquisition levers and the coordination so that they can, they can contract and work with commercial companies because dual use technology has a huge role in creating capabilities for us as we go forward. So being able to faster agile contracting and to work with the sector in a much more productive, innovative way. 
So again, the down select of the performers and moving forward in alignment with capability and security and defense applications. And then the third phase, and this is critical, is the rapid adoption of the key technologies that are successful. And adoption can mean different things. It can mean directly to the warfighter and any one of uh, the NATO nations. And it can also mean just working with the industrial base as we see our traditional companies being able to quickly adopt the technology and become innovative. Um, but it's essential for moving forward is to build that ecosystem and build an ecosystem of trusted capital. So the other thing that Diane is doing is identifying those partners so that we have a pathway for the entrepreneur, even if it's just purely commercial technology, that they have a trusted investment ecosystem that they can, they can work with and signal to the community that the nations and the alliance do not want adversarial players or adversarial capital there. I think that has been a huge step that the nations have come forward and they're embracing. The other sister organization to Diana at NATO is the NATO Investment Fund. And the NIF is structured as a limited partnership and it's designed to support seed capital or A rounds uh, in security startups across the alliance. It is the first multi-sovereign billion dollar Euro fund uh, making investments in security performers. And obviously successful Diana performers would be good candidates for NIF investment. The NIF is only available currently to 23 countries in the alliance that are participating in the fund. And hopefully, as the NIF stands up and is successful, this effort could expand and have growing participation from the North Atlantic portion of the alliance as well, so ourselves in Canada. Um, but as we look at that and as they move forward, again, getting that alliance and working together and investing in ourselves is, is I believe, important for all of us. And just to let you give, give an idea of what the dual use technology solutions are, the three challenges that we've already had of which we've put the performers on contract for are in the areas of data security and interoperability, sensors and surveillance for coastal maritime areas, and <clears throat> energy resilience. And in energy resilience, we focused on microgrid technology. And of course, that also relates to cybersecurity. So these are key areas that I think all of you can see have not only huge implications for Defense Department but, and our NATO alliance, but also for our commercial investment as well. Um, this is also uh, going to be uh, amplified. Uh, North Atlantic, the Canada, and Halifax, they're standing up their hub. I was just in Ottawa this week and uh, looking at what they're doing and launching for their companies. Uh, and, and this is across Canada, although the hub's in Halifax, it is integrating across the university networks and the accelerators and the, and the investment capital. And then the other hub that we have within Diana is the Tallinn Estonia hub. And if many of you are watching on the cyber side, uh, it's impressive what Estonia and the Baltic states have uh, really stood up in cyber defense. And of course, they are very much on the front line. Uh, as they're attacked uh, constantly on the, from the Russians. So we are actually accelerating innovation as well by learning about what's going on, quickly adapting the technology, and hopefully we can be even better at scaling it up and having that innovation across our industrial base here. That said, research and engineering and especially competitiveness within the US is not just about innovation in capability and getting things into the field, because you have to have a foundation in science and technology for you to have that core innovation. And so the research and development is, is key to our national success. And our role in maintaining our technological end is to work to have consistent support in basic and applied research, small business innovation, but overall being able to look at workforce development and university participation, because it really starts there to develop that pipeline of university partnerships and education and workforce development so that we can make our future happen. In 2019, with 90 million in funding over five years, the Defense STEM Education Consortium is working to, has been working to partner with 25 
industries, academia, and nonprofits to provide students and educators with mentorships, internships, career opportunity, and exposure to other educational and workforce development opportunities within the DOD. And one of the more recently established programs in the United States is the University Consortium for Advanced Hypersonics based out of Texas A&M. And this program aims to deliver the innovation and workforce needed to advance national security and critical hypersonic systems. Through these centers of excellence and university-affiliated research center, American universities are tackling some of DOD's biggest technical challenges. Microelectronics, AI, biotech, quantum science, advanced materials, just to name a few. An example of this is the UT Austin Applied Research Laboratory, where they're conducting groundbreaking research into underwater acoustics for the Navy. And I'm sure many of you here at the universities and who are working in the UARCs have experiences and direct uh, contribution into this research for DOD, and I'd like to thank you for that work and look forward to further investments as we move forward. Recognizing the importance of uplifting these communities that are traditionally underrepresented in defense and S&T, Honorable Heidi Shu established DOD's 15th UARC at the Howard University last year, and it's our first university advanced research center at a historically black college and university. This Air Force-sponsored UARC is focused on tactical autonomy. Another in initiative program is the SMART Scholarship, supporting laboratory service programs. This highly competitive scholarship sponsors students in one of the 21 national security cri critical STEM fields. And these students are selected and matched with relevant DOD labs and awarded a full tuition scholarship. And each summer, they intern at that DOD lab, learning and building relationships. Upon graduation, they go to work at this installation for a period of commensurate to their scholarship. One year scholarship is one year of paid service. So that's been extremely helpful. And I hope to have more STEM students and more support in this area as we move forward. And as we approach for the new year, I'd like you to all remember that the technology we invest in today helps determine our outcome of conflicts that we need to fight tomorrow. So being able to fully leverage commercial and defense technology to address our security needs will be imperative, not only for national, but also for our overall economic security. And with that, again, I'd like to thank you very much for being able to highlight these programs and give you a taste of what's going on at NATO and with our allies. And I look forward to working with you and seeing you in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you.